Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Kennedy. I'm the convener of the Pembroke Seminar this year. Uh, and we have been working on the topic of expertise, its significance in modern society and science across a variety of different disciplines, its significance for governance, uh, and its potential methodologically as a space for thinking about po power knowledge questions in a variety of different fields and situations. And we've been at this all year and decided that we would have as our culminating pleasure the opportunity to turn to Annalise Riles from Cornell. Um, Annalise is, well, what is she officially? She's officially the Jack Clark Professor of Law in Far East Legal Studies and Professor of Anthropology at Cornell, directs a program there. Um, she's a well-known legal scholar and also anthropologist and legal anthropologist and anthro-legalist. So, or, <laughs> that is, she's one of these people who's the interdiscipline and past the discipline in, in her work. She's been at this business of thinking about the relationship between these two particular disciplines for 20 years. Um, and in that time, she has published 55 articles, which is one every 4.3 months. I learned this ethnographic technique from Annalise, actually. <laughs> and she's, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. I mean, an article every 4.3 months for 20 years, while she was also holding down 13 fellowships and gave 163 talks. So 163 talks is one talk every 39.75 days. <laughs> and she's already given one today and one yesterday. So you can have a, basically through July off at this point. <laughs> you're, you're, totally, you're totally set. Um, she's at, also in those years been the organizer or co-organizer co of, of 81 conferences. Um, the mind boggles. And I think that the kind of hyperactivity is associated <laughs> in some sense with the capacity to be able to engage deeply across a variety of different disciplines and across a variety of different spaces. Um, so she's worked on a variety of different issues that touch on our theme of expertise, on the um, significance of private arrangements in global governance, on the administrative and governance dimension of human rights as a normative system, um, and the book that she's just published and about which she'll tell us more um, this evening is called Collateral Knowledge, Legal Reasoning in the Global Financial Markets, but the actual original title of the 2010 article on which the book is based is called Collateral Expertise, Legal Reasoning in the Global Financial Markets. So I'm interested to know whether we should have not studied expertise, but actually studied <laughs> knowledge, which turns out to be the more avant-garde thing. At least, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much, David. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I, David is one of the people, one of the two other people who has most influenced the way I think about law and just about everything else. So um, it's a lot of fun um, to, to be part of this, this series. Um, so the book I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit of a strange uh, bird in the sense that in my fantasy about you know, what people would get out of it and who would read it, I have this idea that I hope that you know, um, graduate students and colleagues who are interested in the anthropology of knowledge and the relationship between epistemology and aesthetics and all these kinds of things would pick it up and find something new and interesting in it. But I also have this fantasy, don't laugh, that um, you know, someone, say, at the Treasury Department or at the Bank of Japan, <laughs> or, you know, colleagues who work on financial law, that's even funnier, um, would actually pick it up and also possibly find something of interest. And, and that's to say that I recognize that those two groups share virtually nothing in common, and if maybe this book can be the only thing that they could possibly share in common. Uh, but that means that there's going to be a lot in here that will be of no interest to one or the other of those groups. And, and I recognize that all of you here probably have different levels of interest in slash tolerance for, take your pick, either critical theory on one hand or you know, the details of financial regulation on the other. So don't panic if you hear something you don't like. Just, just wait 30 seconds and maybe I can 
come back to the other piece of this that might interest you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me start by taking you back to 2008 um, when the financial crisis got started in this country. And you may recall that there was this insurance giant called AIG, which got into a lot of hot water. And just, so just to recap, um, AIG had a unit in London, a derivatives unit. The derivatives unit was engaged in a bunch of OTC transactions. And the way that this works in this market is that in order to trade, you have to post collateral with your counterparty. Um, why do th does your counterparty demand this? Because your counterparty doesn't want to have to fuss with the messy realities of national bankruptcy law if they ever want to make a claim on you. They just want to keep the collateral. And all of this, uh, this uh, collateral arrangement is governed by a master contract that everyone in the industry uses called the International Swaps and Derivatives Association Master Agreement. And so AIG had such an agreement with all of its counterparties. And somewhere in 2008, um, Goldman Sachs um, started making what are known as collateral calls. The contract allows the, each uh, a counterparty, um, when it starts to think that either the collateral that it's holding isn't sufficient or that the transactions involved have changed in value such that they need more collateral, to make collateral calls, to demand more collateral. And there was a tussle about how much the underlying swaps were worth, how much the collateral was worth. There were a lot of valuation debates. But basically, AIG ended up complying and handing over more collateral. Very quickly, like within four hours, um, other counterparties in the market heard that AIG had basically agreed to these collateral calls and started making their own collateral calls. And AIG started posting more collateral. And because when I say more, we're talking about really big numbers. Um, this affected all of AIG's balance sheet, which meant that its bond rating was downgraded. And guess what that means? More collateral calls. So we had this cycle where you know bond rating goes down, more collateral calls, more, more cash put under the table, more bond rating goes down again. And within a matter of hours, really, um, AIG owed $55 billion in collateral calls alone to its counterparties. And before the whole thing was over, you, the taxpayer had shelled out $35 billion just to meet those collateral calls. Now, what's interesting to me as a practical lawyer and a critical scholar about this story is that evidently nobody ever thought to ask, wait a minute, what is this contract? And is it really enforceable? And why, why do we actually have this obligation in the first place? And what law governs it? And is this, you know, that these transactions were entered into in London? And it turns out that, you know, under British law, there were some questions about whether this thing was enforceable. But nobody asked those questions. Even though a lot of people had pretty large, like to the tune of $55 billion large, pecuniary interests in asking those questions. And not just the parties themselves, but, um, Lawrence Summers, when he was asked by the press, you know, wait a minute, why do we have to give money so that they can pay out these collateral calls? He said, quote unquote, we are a country of the rule of law, not the rule of men. So now to me, this is a really fascinating story about the, the legitimacy of a certain kind of artifact, right? This collateral, this, this legal arrangement, and the fact that it was so hegemonic in the Gramscian sense that it couldn't be questioned at all. Not even couldn't. No one even thought to question its validity. So that's the kind of thing that this book is about. And um, since some of you are young enough to be, um, uh, to perhaps um, not remember the world uh, that was when I began this research, let me just explain why I got started with this project and, and um, what things were like at that time. So, I started this research in 1997. In 1997, um, this guy, Alan Greenspan, was on the cover of Time Magazine for arguing that markets were self-correcting mechanisms. Don't laugh. You know, that they were entirely, because uh, traders were collectively, if not always individually, rational. And therefore, almost all regulation was almost always suspect. And this was absolutely taken for granted, completely accepted. So the, in the markets, it was accepted. So the wizards of the financial industry were the traders, not the lawyers. Um, and in the academy, it was, it was taken for granted either. I mean, David may have a different recollection. But when I was a law student, 
if you took a financial regulation class, you, got, you learned a lot of economics and not that much law. And, um, and there was a sense that the law was kind of, you know, there wasn't much to the craft of the law itself. That the, the real issue here was economics. Economics was driving the transactions. Whatever the market wanted, the law would deliver. And, and you heard that pretty much on both the right, a la Posner, and on the left from cri the more critical legal studies type approaches. Um, so I think as an anthropologist, I think one thing that anthropology is good at is to notice and then ask questions about orthodoxies. So um, we were interested in, you know, if we were doing field work in the time of the pharaohs, we might say, why do people build pyramids, right? It's interesting that they would think to do this. At this time, it struck me that this was a major, major orthodoxy and just something that we needed to understand. Why does everyone believe this to be true? Why is this an unquestionable dogma, if you like? And so that's what I uh, set out to study. And Really, I set out to study it not thinking that I was going to focus on law. I, my initial research proposal was really about uh, traders. And the surprise for me about this project was to start to realize how much law mattered and how it mattered in the story. And so that's really what the book is about. So the title of the book is kind of a, a play on a couple of ideas. Um, it's focusing on collateral and things like collateral that are private regulatory techniques, tools that the parties use that of course a product of national law of all kinds. Collateral is a product of national bankruptcy law, national securities laws, national property law, contract law, <coughs> lots of natural law. There's a lot of law in there. National law, sorry, not natural, national law. But yet also an, a device that the parties want to use to run an end game around national laws so that they can construct a world for themselves outside of national law. But then the other meaning of collateral knowledge is more in the line of collateral damage, that is, um, something to the side or not direct. Um, one of the um, aspects about law in the markets is its self-image as a sideline matter. You know, uh, you know I'm really just the handmaiden to the trader's self-image. Uh, being uh, sort of on the margins, pay no attention to what's going on here on the side. And one of the things that interests me in the book is how um, how that sideline image, that sort of under the radar screen, hidden in plain view aspect of law in the markets is really part of its efficacy and its power. So, so the book is really about, um, to your theme about expertise, it's really about what is unique about legal expertise in markets, uh, legal reasoning, legal knowledge, whatever term you want to use, um, and why should we care? What are the promises of legal expertise and what are the dangers of legal expertise? And my answer, just in, a, in a, a bumper sticker, is that I'm interested in all of the things that get glossed as the technical about law, not the theories, not the norms, none of that stuff. I'm interested in the stuff that, we get, that gets dismissed as, oh, that's just the technical stuff that lawyers do. That's the stuff that I think um, has the, the greatest amount of um, power and, and what holds the greatest interest for me. Okay, so I think most of you probably know what anthropologists do, but just briefly, how did I do this research? I spent 10 years um, working in the markets. About three years of those were co meant convincing people that I wasn't either totally crazy or someone who was going to you know, sell their secrets or, or, or tell stories about them out of school. Um, and I, f I initially wanted to focus on the Japanese markets, but I quickly became aware that that was a complete, it was no way to differentiate the Japanese market from all kinds of uh, what's going on in the United States and elsewhere because my subjects were often showing up at American law schools, they were um, you know, uh, turning up at committee meetings in New York, they were deeply connected with networks of people that I knew here. And so I ended up uh, writing and about and working in the United States a little bit as well. And basically, I do, um, the, I, I approach this in a traditional, what I think of as a pretty traditional anthropological sense. So it's, uh, the, unlike most of the ways in which we talk about financial regulation in law schools, I'm trying to think about uh, regulation in a, with a focus that's deep and wide, not um, thin and narrow. So following my subjects to the questions that interest them um, in, a, in a way that's qualitative, interpretive, humanistic, and informed by critical and social theory, not just economic analysis, which is the dominant um, way of thinking about financial regulation, I would argue still very much to this day. Okay. 
So let me um, then tell you a little bit about what I found um, in this strange world. So what is collateral? So if you want to understand this hegemonic artifact, for example, collateral, what is it? What do you see as an ethnographer? When you go into a trading room, what do you see? Um, well, um, if, you go into a, if you went into a Japanese trading room uh, at the time of my research, you would see a very, very large room, maybe uh, at least as large as this entire space, maybe twice as big, full of desks with computers and telephones and people on telephones screaming and yelling. And those people um, would sometimes be, uh, you know, as soon as they would finish a call, they would jot down on a piece of paper a note, you know, about the transaction and throw it in a basket at the end of their desk. And then periodically, um, another person, a little portly guy in the case of the firm that I worked in, with a basket, come along, basket on wheels, and collect all those pieces of paper and take them back to another desk in the corner. And that desk in the corner was piled high with paper documents. Um, documents that look like this. Um, um, and many other kinds of documents. And the, the people who worked at that desk were called the documentation people or the back office people. They were the people whose job it was, quote unquote, to paper the trades. So this is the legal stuff. Um, and um, and uh, it's very interesting to me, I mean, we could talk about this if you like, that, that in this day of computerized everything, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, which produces this master contract and um, is really the self-governance entity uh, of, of the swap markets, uh, representing the swap dealers, has not gone to electronic forms. They use paper forms, and they use this very old typeface and you know, there's this kind of, they have this, I think, intuitive sense of the cultural and sociological significance of the materiality of these forms. <clears throat> that you know, having a, a, what having a paper contract and filling it out means to the parties. But in other words, there was, um, there was a lot of paper, and that meant that there were a lot of people. There were a lot of people whose job it was to take care of the paper. So the back office staff, um, uh, were mainly uh, graduate in Japan, mainly graduates of law faculties, but perhaps they were not at the very top of their class, because if they were at the very top, they would have become bureaucrats. If they were the next slice, they would have become practicing lawyers, uh, if they could pass that bar exam, you know, 2% pass rate, and that's the people who take the exam. Um, so the next best job that you can get is to be a back office staff in one of these big firms. Um, and uh, it's uh, unlike the traders who have a kind of glamorous, sexy life, who can earn big salaries and so on. These people have a kind of set, stayed salary cap, not a lot of chance for promotion. They have one skill set. That's the skill that they have. Um, um, and, um, you know, a very, very different kind of even bodily appearance, I would say, you know, uh, just a different kind of person. Um, but of course, these back office staff are only one kind of expert. Um, collateral depends on a lot of other kinds of expertise. So this is a Bank of Japan bureaucrat, another group of people that I worked with. So these would be people who produce the regulation. Then there are law professors, very important in this world, the people who produce articles about whether collateral is enforceable in this way or that way, or what, law, what kind of law applies to this kind of transaction or that kind of transaction, the lawyers in the large law firms who produce legal opinions, and all these people circulate in a world in which they interact, often outside of business hours, uh, committees, and over drinks, and various things. And this is the world, the, the world in which collateral comes to be efficacious. Now, everything I've set up to now, I think, um, if you know anything about the sociology of um, expertise or um, I, my particular slice of that field would be the social studies of finance, um, we talk a lot about cultures of expertise and everything I've set up to now would really fit into the way we talk about it. But what I'm trying to add to this is another piece, which is in addition to the people and the material forms and the social relations and all of that and the institutional relations, I want to say that there's also uh, such a thing as the techniques, and that the techniques themselves have a certain power to them. And here would be my plug, those of you who are totally uninterested in technical law, it's like everything I've said to now, you're just yawning, um, just try to beg you to care or take some interest in the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Because it turns out that as someone interested in critical theory, 
some of what this stuff does is just extremely epistemologically radical. So, um, for example, um, one of my favorite moves in this humdrum is the swap contract um, involves um, what the parties agree to do at a moment of bankruptcy. So remember, they don't want to be subject to the national bankruptcy law of anybody because that would mean that you have to get in line behind all the other people who have claims on the assets of the bankrupt party. So the contract says, in essence, that it will be deemed that at the moment of bankruptcy, sorry, at the moment of bankruptcy minus a split second, the parties uh, netted out all their transactions and settled them in one lump sum. So in the future, we will deem that in the past, we did what was going to happen next. So unbelievable, if you're interested in temporality, an unbelievable notion of time and manipulation of time and an idea about how time can be malleable. And also, if you're interested in epistemology, an unbelievable statement about what one can just make to be real by pronouncing that it's real, right? I mean, sometimes I, I read, if you're interested in the literature on performativity, and I think, who is going to be surprised by this? People in the market totally know that that's what you can do with, with language, right? I mean, so, and, and so, and they do it, moreover, in a, in a, in a genre or modality, which I find so refreshing as, a, as, a, as an anthropologist, you know, a veteran of the disciplinary wars in my field, which is that they do it in an in, in as-if modality. It's not, if you say to them, well, it's not like you can really make time go forward and then go back again. They would just look at you and say, well, of course not. But we'll just act as if that's what we're doing. You know, now what an incredible, incredible position. It's not saying it's true or it's untrue. It's saying we will agree to act as if it's true. Um, and they do all this just in a kind of, you know, that's what we do kind of mode. I think that's really interesting for critical theory. So, um, so in the book, I, I talk about a ton of these techniques. I mean, you know, I've described one to you, but there's about 10,000, and I'm sure, you know, I've just, I, I worked on a few of them. I'm sure in this room we could start a list of many more. I think it would be interesting to start ca cataloging these kinds of moves that lawyers make and the kinds of effects that they have. And I'm not going to go through this list, but there's a lot of stuff there um, that they do, which I think is really interesting. But what all this adds up to, um, I want to emphasize because I, I think sometimes I have a tendency to present this and people think, oh, it all sounds like a really clear, you know, a, a just this well-oiled system in which it all works together. And the fact of the matter is that it's a huge mess. Um, I see this really as a world, a world of glitches, of, of techniques and, and, and knowledge practices and forms of expertise and material documents that never quite add up the right way. So, for example, the um, ISDA document um, use, is written by lawyers mainly in London and New York to be used all over the world, and it has, putting aside the linguistic translation problems of using this document elsewhere, it has all kinds of assumptions about how a market works, like the assumption that it says the parties will clear their trades within three days. Well, it turns out that the computer systems in Tokyo are such that it's actually impossible to clear a trade within three days. So, therefore, ensued endless committee meetings about we will all sign this, understanding that none of us can possibly do this, understanding that what it would mean to do this if we could would be to actually do it in five days here. So three equals five in Japan. So, you know, these kinds of glitches that people on the inside understand, but of course someone in, in, in Frankfurt who wasn't part of the conversation in Tokyo won't know that three really equals five in this particular context. And, and, and there are many, many glitches like that. The people that I worked with, for example, often didn't know a lot of finance. They didn't know a lot of math. And they had a lot of insecurity about the fact that they had to go talk to, you know, um, Yoji over there in the next office about this trade, and Yoji was going to start spewing numbers at them, and they wouldn't really understand what he was saying, but that was the thing that one really should understand, and, you know, the difficulty of uh, interfacing between different forms of expertise, and things like building a computer system to, ma uh, to uh, just to book trades globally involves tons and tons of glitches of different forms of expertise, different languages, different institutional cultures, and so on. So we really have a world of genres of opacity, layers of misunderstanding, 
forms of duplicity. I mean, it's a very, very confusing kind of picture. And this is important to me because I think if you read the Financial Times and you, um, you, you know, you try to get a, a, you know, you ask yourself, so why did the financial crisis happen? You often get this picture of a few evil rogue people floating around, you know, pursuing their self-interest and, you know, ma in a Machiavellian way, manipulating the system for their own personal gain. And that, frankly, is not the world that I saw. I saw a world of people like you and me who are functioning with uh, blinders half on all the time and who, of course, have self-interest, but their self-interest is really complicated. It involves not just making money, but being liked by their spouse and being respected by the guy who was their best friend in law school and on and on. I mean, many, many forms of self-interest. And, um, and so, and I think, unfortunately, this is, I'm sort of sorry to say this to you because if it was a matter of a few bad apples, I think it would be a lot easier to clean up the financial markets than to clean up this. Okay. So, um, so, in other words, what I'm trying to get us to focus on is, um, is, is, is the practice of legal knowledge as itself constitutive of what a market is and what the state is. Um, and sometimes when I say that, I feel is that I, I, some, some people have said to me, are you really demeaning the state you know, by saying that it's just knowledge practices, just knowledge practices? You know, somehow that sounds like you know, the state is real, and you're, 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 you're hurting the state by saying that about the state. And I actually disagree. I think knowledge is really real, and um, uh, it's a really powerful thing. And that it's really time, you know, going back to, you know, something Lawrence Friedman, a professor at Stanford Law School, said years ago, like a, two generations ago, that we really need to study legalism in its own right, and not just as a function of social and political and economic forces. Um, so to take law very, very um, seriously. Okay, so let me just, in that mode, uh, talk a little bit about what I understand legal technique to be, or what some of the pieces of it are, and then what um, some of the modalities of private and public legal technique are, and then I'll stop. So, so I see legal technique to be a constellation of lots and lots of different elements of maybe different orders. So the first one is, frankly, that it produces this effect, right? It's totally boring. And I think that's very, very powerful. It's hidden in plain view. It's this sense of, of being profoundly uninteresting. And I actually think that that is very challenging for critical and social theory, because we're used to finding meaning in things. We're used to making things interesting, right? And a lot of um, what I often get asked to do is, OK, you went into this exotic world that looks really boring. Now make it interesting for us. And I try to say, you know, that's actually doing violence to the very tool of the thing. It's the power of the surface in this thing that's, that I want to preserve. So it's profoundly uninteresting. The other piece of it is that it's a craft-like practice. So it's something learned through apprenticeship rather than conceptual work. Um, it's the joy of producing the perfect figure eight it, or playing the game within a set of rules, if you like Goffman and that sort of work. Um, and it's profoundly practical, that is anti-theoretical. And I, again, I think this is another challenge for us because what do you do with something that uh, resists theorization? It's really what this, this, this does. Um, the other piece of it is that it's self-consciously a tool. It's a relationship of means to ends. That's the self-image of law. You hear it again, and I think they've probably got that written account thing, Yale Law School, right? Really, I don't know. But it's basically, a real, it, that's the self-image. And if you ask these lawyers, you know, what are you doing? They'll say, oh, well, I'm using my tools to further a certain end, fill in the blank. You know, help my company's bottom line, or, you know, save the social group that I care about, or save the world, or save the environment, or whatever it might be, but this notion of my tools are just a little means to an end, right? And yet, this notion of the only a tool, nothing more, I think is really complicated. Because if you actually look at what lawyers do, they'll say to you, okay, so this tool that I have is going to solve this problem for the company. But look at the tool, it's so cool. Look what it can do, look what I'm gonna do. So, of course, one is fo the ends are there. These are not naive athletes, right? But in the meantime, you focus on the means, right? And 
And so it's that relationship of the foregrounded means to the backgrounded ends that I think also defines this tool. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And so, again, it's um, political neutrality, the sense that the tool could be used for any purpose. And I think this is another kind of um, point of challenge for those of us on the critical left, is that we're used to debunking that political neutrality and showing how actually it's not neutral in various ways. And one of the things that interests me is um, whether actually we should take, perhaps we could take, them, take this notion of its neutrality at face value. Do we have to assume that these tools serve only certain ends, or can they be reconfigured in ways that do other kinds of, do other kinds of work? OK, another piece of this is um, routine, routine compartmentalized knowledge. Knowledge, <laughs> knowledge <laughs> that is, um, it, uh, uh, that, that engenders a set of day-to-day -day routines, right? So, so knowledge that, um, that allows people to live out their daily life in very particular ways. And this is actually um, really interesting to me because one of the ways in which anthropologists of markets normally talk about things like finance is just, they're interested in things like diamond markets or you know, these little markets where, you know, if you do something bad, then Cousin Joe is going to talk to Uncle so-and-so and solve this problem. So in other words, it's the social stupid, right? It's the social relations that are really governing things. And one of the things that interests me about the swap traders, and I know this is sometimes they knew people, but often they're talking on the phone to somebody, you know, from Tokyo, they're talking to somebody in Bermuda, or they're talking to somebody in Shanghai. They feel, at least, that they have no connection to this person, except for one thing a shared sense of the tools, right? So, and often, I, I watch these people resolve very, very large disputes by sort of thinking through the pathways of their conceptual routines. And so I'm interested in how this kind of technique actually sometimes becomes its own form of virtual sociality. And so that means that it's designed to travel, right? It's something that can be used and is meant to be used globally. And we, of course, you know, the global breaks down in all kinds of ways. I already mentioned that with the glitches, but I don't want to push that too far because I think it's also interesting to see how it does actually travel um, uh, in particular spaces. All right. Now, in the book, I'm really interested in what I call two different modalities in which one can use these, um, these uh, technologies. One I call the modality of technique, and the other is the modality of technocracy. And on the whole, not exclusively, but on the whole, the modality of technique is something that I think you find more in the world of private lawyers, and the modality of technocracy on the whole, but not exclusively, is something you find more in the realm of the state regulation sphere. Um, and, and what I'm, I try to suggest in the book is that it's the same tools, it's the same pathways, it's just there's a slight difference of emphasis, and that difference of emphasis makes all the difference. So um, let's start with private side. So, and again, I, I don't want to suggest that one can't use this private modality in the public sphere. In fact, I have a case study in the book of an unbelievably fabulous um, bureaucrat in Japan who figured out how to use exactly private law thinking as a regulatory tool for the state and did so to, with great panache and very successfully. Uh, but on the whole, um, you find this in the private market, then in the private sphere, and the idea is that um, the techniques themselves have more of a sense of agency. Um, that people will say to you, you know, yeah, it's my job to do this and help the company in various ways, but what really interests me is what problem I figured out how to solve and how I put together this tool with that tool. And so the techniques themselves are front and center and uh, much loved and just like you know, having a good tennis racket makes you play tennis slightly differently, or, or using a particular kind of computer makes you think about problems in a different way, there's an understanding that using the tools is shaping, and that the tools themselves have a certain agency to them. It's that, it's that as if modality um, that I've been talking about. And so, um, so really, in the short run, again, the emphasis on those tools. All right. Now, in contrast, on the public side, I think th things are much less interesting. And this really goes to my taking seriously the critique of people like Hayek and so on of 
technocracy and the regulatory state and not just trying to fight back but to try to understand what's at stake for it because I had to confront the fact that the regulators themselves kind of thought hey I had a point like it doesn't work what we do and it's really frustrating to always be two steps behind the market and have to solve all problems and and so on and so um, and, and what interests me is the way in which in the world of of the state often although not always regulators have much less respect for their tools. They think of their tools as um, really just a means to an end, and they're focusing much more on those ends. They also think of their tools as combinable with other tools, so mixable with economics or political science or policy studies or what have you. Less of a commitment to the craft of lawyering. They'll say, yeah, I went to law school, but what I really do now is policy. Um, and, um, and much, much more interested in collaboration across disciplines and across different political interests than in coordinating oneself off and saying, I'm the legal team. I think like a lawyer in my own, in my own expert way. And, and I think that's interesting. I think that, um, you know, I see what the technocrats do as much more like um, the social scientific epistemological worldview. It's about there are facts out there and I'm going to act on those facts. Um, so I can see why you know, it's much more comfortable to us to defend that than to defend the world of the private lawyer. But to me, I get much less of a charge out of it. There's much less there that's new to me than in the world of the private lawyer. So why does all this matter? Well, let me just um, say a couple things to probably the maybe half of you in this whole room that's interested at all in financial regulation and, um, about the practicalities and then um, talk uh, about what I think it can do for critical theory. So the first thing is that the world of Larry Summers saying that you know we are we'll, we're a country of the rule of law, not of men, has definitely not passed. Um, it is definitely still the case that collateral has kept on trucking. Co collateral and all the devices like it have kept on trucking through this financial crisis. So if you look at collateral specifically, it's in the Treasury's blueprint for how we're going to solve the how we're going to clean up the financial markets is the bedrock of the markets. It's in ISDA's proposals as the international swaps and derivatives proposals as the only, you know, the principal device through which they're going to, you know, clean their act, act up internally. Um, it is just, uh, you know, no one is saying, boy, you know, why do we have such a faith in these private law techniques? No, that I don't. But at the same time, so that's one thing that's going on. The other thing that's going on is that you have all these people wanting to go back to the New Deal. So the Rockefeller Foundation has actually funded, um, you may know about this, a huge um, project called, I, I kid you not, New Deal 2.0. And it's huge. And there, everyone's involved in it. You know, every famous economist is involved in it. And the idea is, OK, left, this is our chance. Clean up, like raise the slums and build those beautiful towers, a la you know, you know, New York's 1940s. You know, we're gonna really finally get what we want. And I just keep thinking, really? Like those are our two choices? Like either we go back to the old or we go back to the old old. I, I just can't believe that's right. Like it, that just can't be the answer. So what else could we possibly do? And one of the things that interests me is we could perhaps we could start to look in different places for um, where regulation happens and for where the allies for particular, um, let's just call it, more progressive forms of regulation might be. Um, so for example, there are lots of people in the back office um, who have an interest in, in, in partnering with um, those who might want to um, make change. And you don't laugh. I mean, I know when I say this, people will say to me, you, you can't be serious. You know, they're all just a bunch of blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the guy, my main informant, um, wrote a book which, you know, is a, basically a how-to manual for how to fill out those ISDA forms. And it's sold thousands of copies. It's been translated into 10 languages. You know, it's, he's like a rock star in the world of this stuff. But the book is just like literally blank number two can be filled out in this way or that way, you know. And if you read the preface of his book, he honestly says that his goal is to change the world. <laughs> That's his self-image, that, right? So, and, and, and I think we should take this seriously. I think we should take people's aspirations and dreams seriously and think of ways in which we can work with them and say, you know, all right, we're not saying that you have to go and take this position out here. 
But we're saying that as between this position and this position, you have a little bit of wiggle room. And just like a big ship, you know, there are unintended consequences to steering things a little bit this way or that way. And we may not know, none of us know exactly what they are, but notice that the agency you have in the interstices of the way these techniques get used. Um, so that, and, and actually, the, the, um, the Bank of Japan has been amazing at doing this. They figured out that they could um, have fellowships for these people, these little back office people that no one cares about can get a Bank of Japan fellowship now. You know, and it's a huge deal, there's a competition. You come and spend a month at the Bank of Japan at which, during which you do what? You get inculcated into the regulators, regulator's worldview. You start to see yourself as a big deal because you're solving big questions. You give out a lot of information about what's going on on the inside. I mean, these are the kinds of things that take no um, actual enforceable path Legal, legally enforceable power, and yet have enormous social and cultural effects. So, um, so I'm interested in, um, you know, what we could do with these people's own ambitions and, and fantasies um, um, in, in that respect. Now, what about for critical theory? Um, if you're not interested in solving the next regulatory crisis, what can I offer you? Well, I think that one, there's a couple of things that the project tries to do, um, which are a piece with my own interests in my previous book, but I think take it a little bit further. One is um, getting us to take questions of aesthetics really seriously. And I don't mean beauty, I mean form, the power and efficacy of form itself. And, um, and not simply asking uh, epistemological questions, but asking much, much more rich and detailed questions about matters of aesthetics. And also, I'm really interested, maybe we can talk about this, in what comes after critique in our disciplines, right? So Bruno Latour has written a paper called After Critique. Everybody's got a theory about what comes after critique. And I'm really interested in, I think what, I was at a conference last week, and there was a really annoying economist who said, I can tell you in five words what my discipline does. What five words can, he was like, you know, battling haikus. What five words define your discipline? You know, and I thought about it, and I thought, it said, Borrowing the moves of others. Like, that's what we do. We, we, you know, at the, we always claim that we were describing things, but I think what we were really doing was going out there and finding something that could be borrowed back on our own theoretical uh, and methodological terrain, whether it was a notion of personhood, theory of subjectivity, what have you, something we could learn from someone else. And I think there's a lot that we can um, borrow in a kind of empathetic way, and I don't mean by empathetic that we embrace everything these people do as good. I mean a, a generous um, form of engagement. Um, so there's a lot we can borrow from law. So I'll stop there. Thanks. about this in the press that there, were, there was this ogre and there were all these little lamb victims, right? You know, and I think 
you're getting 30% return. What did you think was going on? Like, give me a break, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, right. So the, again, glitches, blind spots, people willingly looking the other way, you know, um, and wanting, again, to place all the moral blame in one place so that we don't have to think about the way in which perhaps um, blame is spread very, very widely to, to all of us in some sense, you know. Um, now, so how do we get to the middle ground? Um, so there's, um, there are some the historians working on the early history of the SEC right now who've done some interesting work on why that agency was so robust at its inception, right? Why was it able to hold its own in a way that it doesn't seem able to do anymore? Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, you had a bunch of uh, very progressive lawyers who went down um, some from the academy and some from practice to Washington to run that agency, they had an incredible sense of self-confidence. It wasn't about their sense of the mission, about what was good and what was bad. It was about a sense of professional self-confidence. We are the best damn lawyers around, and we can beat these guys at their game any old day, right? And, um, and, and, and I think that's really an important piece of this, because part of what I see with a lot of regulators in the US is a sense of lack of confidence, you know, an unwillingness to play the game because a sense that they're going to be outmaneuvered by people in the markets, um, you know, who are just smarter than they are or know more than they do or so on. And, and, and a question of how you create that, that robust professional culture again um, is, I think, an important one. Um, I, I guess I would say, so I, of course it's important to have people who, you know, have all the right interests and care and so on. But one piece I think we haven't focused on enough is that sense of believing in one's own techniques and one's own professional skill. And then seeing that one's counterpart in the market is also a professional who one can engage with in one of two ways, as a collaborator or as an opponent. Right? And that that can switch back and forth at various moments. So, so I think having a sense of self confident professional self-confidence and knowledge of you know, being tooled up gives one an ability to be ambivalent about and have a complicated view of who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Um, and see these people as people like me who I can play with and against. Yeah. It seems to me, and maybe this isn't self-confidence, but it seems to me like Confidence in technique is sometimes can, can also be a problem if you think about the the technique of credit rating agencies. I mean, that's a place where there was a lot of faith in technique, and in fact, there still is an institutional faith in technique, even if people don't think that there should be. Um, yet, it was a total failure, and like, I mean, in terms of so many, so many things that were rated. Yeah, so if you read a lot of the literature on experts, like I'm thinking of Tim Mitchell's book, um, Rule of Experts, right, the classic book of expertise, um, you get this image of these people as basically overconfident, arrogant experts who think that they know how to, you know, build anything they have to build and, of course, miss all the mistakes that they make along the way. And that's a totally plausible theory or critique of experts, and one that fits with, I think, a lot of, um, you know, literature from Foucault on that line. Um, it's not what I found. I didn't meet a lot of overconfident Arabic people. I met a lot of people who were deeply insecure about their tools. People who had a sense that, God, I'm expected to predict whether the yen is going to go up or down next month. I can't even predict what it's going to do next, tomorrow, you know, in the next hour. And I have to somehow live with this. And I'm supposed to get out there now and stand in front of the TV cameras and tell people what's going to happen. And it's all going to fall on me when it doesn't work that way. And so I think that sometimes we've misread these people's arrogance about their tools as a deep fear and, and a knowledge of the, the lacuna in their, in, in their skills. Um, and, um, and what's interesting to me is that the private lawyers don't feel that way. Private lawyers don't feel so scared. You know, it's sort of this sense of, well, you know, I use my tool, and if it doesn't work out, I use some other tool, and 
you know, like, uh, we'll, you know, we'll deal with the problem when it comes up, and this is going to get us from tomorrow to, to today to tomorrow, and then tomorrow, who knows what's going to happen. One of the things that interests me is why don't they have, why do they, where does their self-confidence come from, right? And, and you see it also in the, out, the critiques from the outside. Um, you hear a lot of criticism of the expertise of technocrats, right? Um, so, or, or, uh, but very little criticism of the expertise of the private lawyers. And so critique doesn't stick to them. They're more like Teflon. Um, so I guess, so you were asking about, um, about the rating agencies in particular. I wouldn't say that the rating agency is a technique. I would say the rating agency is a symbolic statement made by a company as a whole for a particular performative effect. And it, the techniques are the negotiations within that rating agency between the you know, person, you know, on the third floor and the person on the fourth floor about what they're going to do about this bank calling them and demanding X or Y in exchange for something else. You know, so, so I'm not, so, so maybe I have a different view of what a technique is. But, are, but don't a lot of the techniques, like, for example, um, value at risk, which was a sexual mm -hmm. technique mm -hmm. of federated agencies, like, they don't actually work? Yeah, so, so, that's, so this gives me a chance also to beat up on economists. So um, what's interesting, too, is that I think that I'm starting to think that economic knowledge works very differently than legal knowledge. Um, and, and this goes against everything that I was taught, because I was taught in law school that law was just another technocratic form of knowledge just like anything else. I mean, Posner himself has said that there's no religion in law and economics, right? That the way lawyers think is no different than the way economists think. I actually don't think that's true. I think that when um, people talk about something like VAR from, from a financial yeah, perspective. Yeah, talking into the microphone. Oh, sorry. When people talk about something like value at risk um, and use the tools of financial economics, they do so in a much more flat-footed, um, this is really real kind of way. Whereas lawyers use their tools in a much more ambivalent, um, much less committed way. And that that difference really matters because it allows you to re-steal the ship at particular moments in other ways. So I would say your complaint is about economists. It's not about us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question about the scale of the glitches, and I love that picture that you had. Um, you said the glitches. Um, and so it, it, makes, it makes complete sense to me that glitches are necessary to make things productive across difference. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so some of the glitches, I think, are really um, important in keeping people's commitment to the system itself. So I really, I, I actually came to think about halfway through this project that the question of why somebody shows up for work every day is a really profound and significant question. What makes somebody keep going, right, and not just throw in the towel and say, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing this anymore, right? And you know, and as I start to start watching people and trying to figure out what is it, because they're not truly committed to this bank's bottom line. They're not, you know, they don't see hope of becoming the president of this bank for themselves. You know, what is it that keeps them going? And part of it is, there, there are certain things in the long run, dreams people have, like saving the world. But in the short run, there's the problem of solving the problem that you're facing, right? And the sense of being engrossed in the problem that you have. So a glitch from a big perspective, what we see as a glitch, is from the actor's point of view, a problem to be solved, right? Something that engages their affect, their attention, their desire, their energy, their passion, you know, their identity. And, and so, so a lot of those problems, you know, um, we're very, very constitutive of the stickiness of this market in the sense of keeping people uh, feeling that there was a there there that was important to them. So like, for example, um, again, my main informant, the guy who wrote the book, um, said to me one day, he said, you know, Annalise, I just found out in America there's this guy called a global collateral manager. 
And I said, what does he do? And he said, he's a guy who knows both law and finance. And I said, wow. Like, so so what is he, what's his life like? What does he do? And he said, oh, you know, he just like stays in the Ritz Carlton all over the world and he like travel all the time and he's playing golf everywhere and it's just so great and that's what he does. And I said, oh, really? That's really great. Well, maybe you could become such a person. Like, maybe that would be something you'd like to do. And he said, oh, no, no. I'm like, that's, I, I'm just a dumb lawyer. I could never learn that other finance thing. But I could tell that it was, and I, I think he really had that idea that he couldn't possibly do it. But just the sheer fact that there was something tantalizingly on the edge of the horizon of that glitch of the economists and lawyers was something that kept him going. Yeah. I particularly liked your uh, especially provocative moments, and um, one of those really did provoke me. So I wanted to kind of, you know, ask uh -oh. you to say a little more about it. It provoked me in a very positive sense, but I wasn't sure I totally understood it. And that was where you talked about how, you know, we as anthropologists perceive the idea of like purported political neutrality as a mask, right? As something that is impossible. And I love it. You know, I think you're absolutely right. Like we, we do think that. You know, every time somebody says this is a political, we say no, it has to be political. But as I was thinking about this, I was I was trying to kind of understand what you meant by the, the sort of the relationship between the political and the neutral, right? And mm. it struck me that just because something is or can be neutral in the sense that it can be potentially be appropriated in different directions or to different ends doesn't mean that it's a political. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, what is the clarion call here for us? Right. Like how do we kind of understand that relationship between the political and, and kind of this idea of neutrality and these, you know, and these tools. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't want to take this too far. I mean, I, I certainly don't want to, you know, deny that there are economic forces out there, that there are political interests in the markets. You know, I, I, I have the luxury of having this huge foil, which is everybody else who works on this stuff. You know, so I can, I can not say those things because everyone is saying it, right? And so if I was, if this was tabula rasa, my picture would probably look a little bit more, you know, complicated than I'm making it out to be. But I'm just saying, I think that in just moving to debunk and show the political every time we encounter something that claims neutrality, we miss the way in which it might very well be political, which is through its use of the neutral, right? And, and also we miss the unintended effects of a lot of this stuff, right? And the ways in which, you know, in a kind of Tai Chi-like way, it sometimes can be used exactly against its intent. Um, and, and that's, I think, the kind of stuff that anthropologists should be really good at describing, right? Because you can't make that stuff up in your office. You can't think it up. You have to see it, right? And so that's our, that's our little contribution. <laughs> yeah. So you have the conflict or kind of unequal conflict between the technique of the public and the technique of the private, which is basically the pluralless by comparison. But within the private, it's as if they were all sharing something mm -hmm. rather than having mm -hmm. adverse interests. So I want to go back to the very first thing you opened with, which is why was it that, or how was it, that nobody contested the contracts and the yeah. Which is puzzled me since the day it didn't happen. Um, or tried to unwind the instruments right. that they didn't understand and they knew they didn't understand it, so probably knew it had a glitch. So, right. there, so there was no right. there was no no sophisticated private lawyer who was as sophisticated as you claim that they are and as I think that you're right to claim they are, would have failed to understand at some level that the uh, you know multiplied leveraging would be unwound. Uh, and yet they didn't. And so I'm not sure that's where conflict comes into it, mm -hmm. but it's not just that they all had billion dollar states and not doing it that were shared. Right. They also had billion dollar states that were adverse. Right. That's and right. so how does adverse interest affect the operation of these techniques against one another? I mean, is that a Tai Chi idea? Did you have think, is there a technique of Tai Chi? within the private sector, mm -hmm. where you encountered this technique with that technique, and did you learn anything about that in the work? So you're saying a bunch of, I think, really interesting and different things. So yeah, so the let's just talk about AIG for a second. Why did somebody not 
Why did nobody speak up, right? And, and this, I think, goes to your point about when do the glitches add up to something that's not a glitch, which is something very sticky and hegemonic, right? I mean, how can it be that you have all these glitches, but then at the end of the day, you've got a, just sort of a belief, an overwhelming belief, in the enforceability of these contracts? Um, the people that I worked with, you know, if you were to say to them that the is the contract itself was unenforceable, I they would just I wouldn't even dare say that. To them. That's like, it's just such an absurd statement to them. That this is beyond one's comprehension. And I think they see themselves as playing a game of conflict within the parameters of this 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 document, right? About clause four versus clause six or what have you, but not about the overarching question of why do we even enforce this document in the first place. And you know, the question of how they came to see it that way, yeah, it's, it's puzzling, right? Because the economists would all tell you, well, they, they shouldn't, right? They shouldn't see it that way. Um, but I think that, for me, the story is about the fact that this, this game is so thick and there are so many thousands of people whose life project is devoted to the fact that this is real, right? That one can't even conceptualize an argument that would tear that all down in one shot. And so, they don't. So how does that go with the as if idea? It seems like the opposite idea. So, yeah, so, so I think we're talking at different levels. So the as if is about the moves that one makes on the inside. But there is some point at which that produces a reality, right? A, a reality that's incontrovertible. And, um, you know, and that's good. We, we want there to be a reality. We're not all schizophrenics, right? So we want there to be, so, but the question is, how could we use something like as if tools to produce a different reality that's uncomfortable? It's kind of what I'm hoping for. But that wasn't your whole question. It was about conflict. Conflict. Um, and and you, you think that conflict of interest produces using the techniques in different ways? It, that's a valid question. So, did, it, what did you learn about the way in which people do battle within the terrain of technical expertise on the private side? Is it that the battle gets constrained to the clause one, clause two, but it's not about this to do as a whole? People are willing to go down rather than do something that they fear will shake out? I think they wouldn't even put that way. That would, that would be way more deep than they, they would never get to that, what the last phrase. So, so how does that work? For them, when they are doing battle, the Japanese versus the American, the private, whatever, the AIGs versus the counterparties, right. what is their, how do they deploy their techniques to win? Right. So, this is going to seem totally impossible to you. <laughs> um, but there is surprisingly little conflict given the notional amounts at stake. Given what's at stake, you would think that these people would just be fighting with each other all the time. And I really want to go and talk to the people at Goldman about this, because people in Japan were really shocked that Goldman did this. It just seemed like beyond the pale. Like, you don't take this that far. You don't make them that public. I mean, that's sort of not what you do. And, um, and in the past, we've had very, very large, um, let's call them, you know, mis misunderstandings. So I saw a lot of, you know, it, it happens, um, 20 times a day that trader A thinks that they swapped a billion dollars, trader B thinks they swapped 10 billion dollars, they wrote the nom different zeros on the piece of paper, and you have to resolve that, right? And as a legal anthropologist, we study disputes, so we look for those things, right? So I went looking for the disputes, and how do you handle it, and the ISDA document says that you have a dispute resolution mechanism, I want to see it in action, I want to watch it, you know? And they just laughed at me, they said, nobody uses that damn thing. And I said, well, what do you do? We just get rid of it. We make it go away. I said, well, you can't do that. That doesn't count. You know, what do you mean you make it go away? It's, well, we just split the difference. Or, I don't know. We just, and, and the answer is that they really let these things go rather than take it to a level of fighting in a legalistic language over those issues. And that's quite interesting, right? I, so I asked them, I said, you know, you've got this dispute resolution structure that says, um, you're supposed to, you know, have a tribunal, and there's supposed to be like two, one member from each, one representative from each firm. It's kind of arbitration model. 
And they said, oh, we've never done that. I said, why not? I said, because nobody wants to serve on this thing. I mean, you have everything to lose, all your friends will hate you, and nothing to gain. Why would you serve on this thing? So no one wants to serve on this. So much easier to just let the lowest person, and this is actually interesting to me, it's the lowest person on the totem pole who resolves this dispute rather than the highest person for the most part. Just split it within a certain, certain um, uh, range. Um, so I don't like that answer because that sounds completely cohesive and it sounds like this is a world of people who don't have conflict and that can't be right. And they certainly do have a lot of conflicting interests, but you know, I didn't see the tools being used in that way as much as I expected to. But do you have a different experience? You've seen a lot of these people. You've, you know some of these people. You're one of those. You play one sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I, I know the Lloyd's name. Explain to me that the internal culture of the insurance business was that their word was their bond. Now, if you have that culture, and it needs perhaps a uh, piece of paper only to right. make sure that there's no loss of memory as opposed to not a bond. Mm -hmm. So then that can, that can take care of the issue of how it is that no one bothers to worry about the enforcement of the piece of paper because the piece of paper isn't really the bond. The piece well, of paper is only the documentation of the word. And, and then if I can just follow that up, and then what happens is that in the deregulated world where you have gold, Goldman Sachs coming in, the banker coming in against the insurance company, right. you now have a clash of cultures. Uh, and the banker is thinking that this, he, this is an enforceable situation or there's a, a path here to be followed to secure his position and ignores perhaps that there, it's the word that's, that's, that's important and it's not coming in and grabbing this cloud. And so that, that's what creates the problem. Is that possible? Well, um, so I don't actually think that in this, in the OTC market, there are some specialized markets like um, the corporate bond markets in which um, the players know each other and there's a lot, there's a sense that, you know, where does your bond and, you know, you go to somebody and you say, I screwed up this time, can we just forget about this transaction? And they'll say yes because they know they're going to be in a similar position next time. That's not the world of the kinds of, let's say, currency swaps and the sort of major, you know, l large, you know, anonymous swaps that I was dealing with. Um, but I think one of the things that you raise, which is just a question for me that I'm interested in, and it's not part of my research, so if you know something about this, I'd be interested to know, is whether the AIG story is, in some respect, a product of the fact that even though AIG's derivatives unit was a derivatives unit, it was within the culture of an insurance company. And I'm learning a little bit more about insurance companies and the fact that they're regulated very differently from banks and they have different um, experiences with litigation, you know, and, and, and much else means that there are different implicit expectations about how things get handled. And, um, and I've heard some people say, you know, the reason why AIG main boss didn't come in and sort of check up on these people was that they saw this much more like, you know, um, the way you handle the fact that most insurance companies are insolvent most of the time, which is, you know, you just kind of move things around and it's okay because the government will never let this insurance company go go under. Um, whereas banks have a different, a slightly different, we have a slightly different relationship to that. But, um, yeah. Oh. Um, the uninteresting and then also the interesting. Um, it seems like part of the reason that you're kind of turning away from critique is that you're looking at this thing, collateral knowledge, that sort of just by the wayside, it's not like a sort of the various right. thing that needs to be uncovered, and it's not working as ideology or politics, it's just, you know, the way that these sidelined things kind of affect how people view the game. Um, and so in that sense, you're looking at something that other people haven't done. And then there's this kind of other 
something that seems more sort of fluid, promising, interesting, pragmatic, um, like sort of to, to have more value and be able to respond value more mm. with more immediacy. Mm. And to then try to make institutions, the discipline like anthropology or the way that public organs regulate, more like that kind of outside space. Mm. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's sort of about so it's kind of interested in that, how the, the, the private legal reasoning seems to be, on the one hand, this sort of boring thing that no one has noticed. But on the other hand, they seem to have this, you know, and they are boring people, right? They don't dress as Natalie as traitors, and, you know, they don't have the possibility to, you know, become a boss one day. Um, but you're also kind of claiming a kind of interestingness for them. Um, mm. And you're also interested in why they're interested in their work and, and things mm. like that. So that doesn't totally add up to a question, but um, <laughs> I was kind of thinking about the dual role that that, that whole area kind of plays in the talk. In other words, that I hear you, your critique to be... No, no, it's not at all critique. It's sort of a, it's sort of a like, what, what role does the more interesting play in how you see yourself sort of speaking to public Stay with the boring. But I've, <laughs> I've, I've kind of, you know, I've collapsed back into the old academic trope, which is to take the, you know, exotic and make it familiar, to take the thing that's ununderstandable and make it exciting theoretically and so on. Well, I, I mean, the reason I'm asking this is I think it's actually a kind of, it's become a really interesting methodological question, which is that, you know, you want to look outside of your right. institutions uh, to the ways that, you know, normal people are functioning in the world and doing things that are actually quite interesting and not nefarious, and they have their own desires and hopes and things like that. And this comes up in the Latour piece, you know, we want to feel about our work the way we feel about bird watching, you know, like mm -hmm. that sort of a role. But then once you start to say, okay, and how can we use that to affect how these institutions work, right, you do kind of run into this methodological problem of like, how do you then take that sort of looser kind of in the world, bring it into an institution and not have it anymore. Right? Like, what's the, there is a kind of strong theory, weak theory. You mean, how do you take this kind of stuff and when you move it into the public sphere? Like, so you're saying, okay, so let's go and talk to these people and sort of think about, help them to think a little bit about how they can aim the big shifts that right. this way or so they right. have it, right? Uh, and, and then, you know, and let's invite these bathroom guys and give them a fellowship agreement into the bank and have them kind of share knowledge with us and start thinking about themselves as related to policy and things like that. Um, and then, but then at what point does that sort of pulling all of that back into the institution end up with the sort of bad boring where you feel like you can then have this whole new set of regulations that are non-responsive and not. So I don't think it's a problem with your talk. I think it's like a... An a conundrum. Well, it's a conundrum, and, and, but I'm really interested in how the interesting Yeah, I mean, so I, so I think that's true. Um, in the book, I also try to talk about people doing it the other way. So not just taking the people in the market who do this and making them into shadow government actors, but thinking of how you can um, borrow some of the moves, like, for example, the as-if move, borrow that in the way that you do regulation itself. So, you know, not just borrow the people, but borrow the tools, right? In some ways, that's, I think, for me, it's hard to explain in a talk like this, but it's more full of promise because I think it's, it kind of makes um, the act of regulatory work also much more fun and exciting for the people who do it. Yeah. Um, uh, but no, I, think, I mean, I think you're raising a really good question, which is, 
you know, none of us totally has control over the interesting and the boring and all the other aspects of our tools. And to sit here and even suggest this is how we would use them in such and such a way sort of suggests that I have more, I can set in motion something that I know will turn out in a certain way when in fact I, I, I make no such claims. Um, I, I actually think just jiggling the thing a little bit could be a good thing to do, right? But I make no strong argument about what the long-term outcome of that might be. <laughs> Yeah. The question also about brightness, which you showed us a few pictures of people sleeping, and then you have this, the, all the tools together, which was actually a pretty heterogeneous list, but you move past the list of the boring stuff pretty quickly. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how all those things fit together, what in fact made them all fit together in the same list. Mm -hmm. It actually seemed like pretty, there was paper, there was a set of people did the paper, there was, it was actually a pretty heterogeneous set of mm -hmm. tools. So what made them all tools and all fit? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I, it, 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 you know, it, it's not by any a complete list. You know, it's uh, a list of things that I saw that I thought were interesting. Right? <laughs> 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 right. Right. What right. What made me put them? Right. What made me put them together was that um, one could. So first of all, they ignited the passions of the people that I. Right. So they were, they, they were uh, conceptual achievements of their work. Um, but also that they could work in a variety of different contexts. So a lot of these tools, if I can get the list again, um, a lot of these things um, are, um, oops, that didn't work. Um, a lot of these things are, um, are tools that one can use in across different areas of financial law for different purposes across different areas of law generally. So one of the ones that I write about, for example, is this notion of a hollow core, a law that looks like a law, you know, it's passed, but all of the substantive terms of the law are left out to be interpreted later by the bureaucracy. And people say, yay, we got a law. But what it means is completely open for later discussion. And you know I first thought, I can't even propose this. This is so weird. It's like so Japanese. I mean, no one would do this. And then it actually turns out that our healthcare law is like this, and our new financial regulation is like this, and all the other laws say we have a law, and everything will be later determined by the Department of Health and Human Services or Treasury Department or what have you. And it's a, it's bureaucrats tell me this is a standard tool. We all do this all the time, right? And so they see it as a catalog of, as in the catalog of things that they know how to do, um, and. Um, Bureaucrats that I, you know, I'm now working with some American bureaucrats, and the really, really smart ones and good ones claim to sort of have a secret list of all the tools and moves that they know how to use, like stuff that they've learned, stuff that they've watched people do, right? Stuff, and I think just making a list would be interesting and useful for us, theoretically speaking. But yeah. yeah. Um. Right. 
you were boring and you just take it for granted. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But um, of course, by uh, 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 making explicit the implicit right. thing for granted, then, okay, well, so is that, you know, sort of like empowering the boring or is it making it interesting? <laughs> um, you know, maybe it's six of one hand isn't the other. But uh, it reminds me of a conversation I had some um, months ago with uh, the, the, the wonderful uh, legal historian Robert Gordon. Um, and, uh, you know, I, of course, was joined some things to me, and I said, maybe you can answer this question that I've been uh, uh, struggling with for months now. Um, so you know these moves that, that attorneys are always making in legal arguments, these, these, like, and they're always remembered afterwards so those these big breakthroughs, like, you know, the first person to decide that sexual harassment is simply a kind of sexual discrimination and can be pursued that way. Um, and, uh, you know, so like, what is that called? What's the term for that? Yeah. Thinking? Uh, and he just looked at me and said, well, that's right. just what we do. Absolutely. You know, it's like, Absolutely. there is no word for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But see, this is why, in a nutshell, we need ethnographers of law. Because I think all the real power of this stuff has an American name. Right? The, the stuff that really does the work, the stuff that really does the work, by definition, in every field. I mean, people just know this about ritual, right? You, if you, the stuff that can be named is irrelevant. It's the stuff that can't be named, right? And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, what we're really teaching in a law school classroom has nothing to do with what we seem to be teaching. We all know that, right? But you just, but as someone looking at this world from the outside, you put your finger on it. What do you call that, right? Now, that raises a funny question for me, which is, what am I doing by calling it, right? You know, um, somebody told me once that if you make something explicit, it doesn't have any power anymore. So is this a form of critique? You know, simply outing these things and naming them? Does it cease to work when you actually have a bureaucrat's playbook? Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? In the immortal words of someone. <laughs> I mean, as you're talking, it's reminding me of the old science studies idea about the black box, right? That you have to have these black boxes, um, but then if other fields haven't agreed that the box is the box that you're dealing with, then suddenly your whole question doesn't make a lot of sense to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, I think you're probably, um, you're probably right that I'm just, I'm just thinking about whether I can think of an example of a situation in which different kinds of experts didn't share the same as if, right? That's what, what you're suggesting. Um, but most of the examples that I can think of are more like the black box in the sense that one wouldn't, one wouldn't even get so close to the finance people to try to understand what their as if is. You would just say, that's a finance question, <laughs> right? You know, 
or, or that's a question for the regulator. Or, you know, or you're asking me about how what we do affects the public at large. I'll say that that's a question for the academic or something. You know, or sort of this move of displacing certain questions onto other fields, um, which feels a little bit different to me. But I want to think, I mean, it's a very helpful point. I want to think about that some more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe one way of thinking of this is, is that there are many different kinds of assets and then many different assets within their own category. Yeah. So one yeah. would be the kind of asset that you just developed, like, oh, that's, that's for finance, that's not, that's not what we do, we do this. They have their assets, we have ours, and we know that they have them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then I'm also wondering whether there's, um, there, there are also these assets that are more kind of synchronic or structural. And mm. One would have to be, I mean, would be something along the lines of this kind of temporality issue that you brought up, right? We all know, right? And, and you know, three days is five days, et cetera, you know, all these kind of sort of weird structures that everybody knows are not real, but then are used as real. But then underneath, I'm wondering whether there's not also another one where that has to be also so, and so that's where you have to say, no, 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 you know, that, that's your initial question. Like, why did nobody, you know, right. say, you know, wait a minute, you know, what is, what, what's the status of this law? Right. So yes. that's certain, and then it gets very complicated because these things that interact, right? Um, right. The limit, you know, the, the structuring of the fields and, and multiple fields, mm -hmm. but then I think there's also somewhere kind of fun, more fundamental structure disavowal. Um, you know, what do you mean by that? What, what would be an example of that? Well, the disavowal would be there are certain questions that cannot be asked. Right, absolutely. absolutely. And they're not necessarily the same. And I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't even call that an as if. So back to this question of, you know, I remember I went through a week where I decided that I wanted to ask everybody what they thought the effect of that netting, that agreement to think that you had netted out your all your obligations a second before the bankruptcy. Right. What that meant for you know all the other interests in society, the workers who weren't going to get paid, the landowners who weren't going to get their rent paid, you know, all the other parties who would have been first in line, but now won't, there won't be money to go around, you know. And I asked everybody, people in government, they just looked at me like it was just a total. I mean, first a fogginess, and then suspicion. You're an outsider. If you ask questions like that, you're an outsider, right? Because you absolutely, not you're a mean outsider who's got other political interests. You're just a, a stupid person who doesn't understand how the game is played, right? You're, you're not somebody who's smart. Savvy. Yeah, savvy, exactly. And I don't think that's as if. I think it's, you know, I think we need another word for that kind of disavowal. Don't you think? I mean. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, the word I think is disavowal. Right. I, think, I like that better. I think that's, it's not a black box. It's not an as if, it's a disavowal. But the as ifs add up to those disavowals, right? Right, I mean, that's why it seems so complicated. Right, right. That's really helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Thank you. So we have this room for 31 more minutes with <laughs> an astonishing spread of water and white crackers <laughs> and, and other items. And so please